I think the explanation of why people get functional neurological disorders is extremely important for patients. And I think this is something that is often um, not recognized by the medical profession. One of the problems is that there isn't a standard explanation for why these symptoms come about. You won't find such an explanation easily on the internet, apart from on this website, and you won't find it um, in any standard textbook. So a lot of doctors simply don't know why the symptoms come about. I think the model we work on in this uh, institution is a model. It is uh, not necessarily the truth, but it is an explanation that seems to be plausible, that it seems to be generally acceptable to patients, and which fits the observations that we have. So we adopt it because it is useful. But it may have to evolve with time. So the model we have of the generation of these functional symptoms is that you have to consider the brain has two parts. There's the rational part of the brain that you do your thinking with, that uh, you do your decision making with. And then there's an emotional bit. The emotional bit is perhaps a bit more difficult to understand, but I think of the emotional part of the brain as the bit that is responsible for looking after all the automatic functions that your brain does without you having to think very hard about it. And these include not only the emotions of love, fear, hate, uh, anxiety, that sort of thing, but also looking after things like the automatic movements that we do. For example, when you drive a car, you don't think carefully about the individual movements required to turn left or turn right. It's all automated for you. And you can do lots of other things while you're driving. You can talk to your partner, you can listen to the radio, uh, you can ponder the day ahead, and you only use a very small part of your consciousness to undertake the driving task to decide where you're going to go. The rest is automatic. And the emotional part of the brain is actually controlling most of that for you. So it's an automated bit of the nervous system. Now the trouble is that autom automatic part of the nervous system, the emotional part, has to communicate with the rational bit. And that normally is not a problem. But in some circumstances, it can be a major problem. And what happens is that the emotional part of the brain can sometimes find it difficult to communicate with the rational bit. That tends to happen when people have lived through very difficult personal circumstances. So when you're living uh, your life through uh, high levels of anxiety or stress or uh, di emotional difficulties, what tends to happen is that the natural response of that is to suppress your emotional responses. You get, if you like, habituated to these high levels of stress and you cease to be sensitive to them after a while. And the effect of that is that the emotional part of the brain ceases to be able to communicate effectively with the rational part of the brain. That works very well to help you get through difficult circumstances in your life. And we, we all know that people who've lived through particularly difficult circumstances, for example, living in a war zone, will come out of that very tough emotion. They will sometimes appear to be quite emotionless for a while, and they certainly find that the normal stresses of everyday life are hardly noticeable to them. So it's an adaptive response to those high levels of stress. The problem is that when you cease to be in those very high stress situations, the emotions start to return. And it's at that point when people can start running into difficulties, because the emotional part of the brain really doesn't like being ignored. And if it detects that you're in a high stress situation and you're not really feeling it, you can't communicate that to the emotional bit of the brain, to the rational bit of the brain, characteristically the emotional part of the brain will start to interfere with the way the rational bit works. And it does that in very characteristic ways. It interferes with the way that sensations from the body are filtered by the nervous system. So sitting there, your brain is constantly being bombarded by sensations from many millions of sense organs in your body. From the muscles, from the bones, from the joints, from the skin, from the eyes and ears. All this is bombarding the brain with sensory information. And most of it is noise and people are very good at shutting out what is not important so they can concentrate on what is important. In these circumstances, the emotional part of the brain can fiddle with that filtering process. It can either turn up the gain so that sensations get through to consciousness which shouldn't, which should normally be filtered out. Or sometimes it goes the other way and turns down the gain so that you can't really feel what should be there. And that, the correlate with that is either feeling things that aren't really there or feeling pain more intensely than it is, or sometimes losing sensation in parts of your body. 
The other thing that the emotional part of the brain can do is interfere with the link between willing movement, that is deciding you want to move, and executing movement. Uh, if you find that difficult to understand, I usually use the simile of, say, wanting to do a bungee jump. There are some people who decide they want to do a bungee jump and they'll go into the middle of the bridge and they'll get themselves kitted out with the highs, and then they find when they come to the jump that they just can't jump. They can't move. And uh, they freeze. And however hard they try, how embarrassing it is that they can't do the jump, they just find they can't do it. And that's not because they're sick in any way, it's because the emotional part of the brain says, no, nope, it's too dangerous, not doing that and they can't do the jump. So in the same way, in, in these circumstances, the emotional part of the brain can actually stop people moving. It can interfere with that link between saying you want to move your arm and actually executing it. And that feels very odd. In the case of the bungee jump, you know deep down that it's fear that's stopping you doing the bungee jump. But when you have this underlying emotional disconnection caused by living through very difficult circumstances, you lose that ability to feel the emotion behind it. All you feel is that something's stopping you moving. You, it feels as if you've forgotten how to move your limb and that can be very disconcerting. Sometimes it goes the other way and a move, extra movements are generated by the nervous system and that's why people get tremors.